and there are fairly well-defined rates at which a normal nerve conducts. And uh, something developed here by Dr. Robinson in our own PM&R uh, rehab department uh, is the combined sensory index. And so this involves comparing the median nerve, which does run through the carpal tunnel, with the same patient's ulnar nerve in the same hand, which doesn't run through the carpal tunnel. And so you get uh, sort of your own control group within the hand. And so he's found that this is a very sensitive and specific way to identify carpal tunnel <coughs> syndrome. So what do you do if you have a patient with carpal tunnel syndrome? You start with the basics, which are uh, typing in a more ergonomically correct fashion than I do. And you can force uh, an individual to use the hand in a more normal fashion by realigning it with a splint and have them do so, particularly at night, it turns out, because again, we, we tend to hyperflex at night. Uh, for folks where that initial uh, conservative measure is unsuccessful, we offer an injection. And this is usually a combination of local anesthetic for immediate pain relief, uh, composited with, I use dexamethasone sodium phosphate, it's a steroid, which uh, decreases inflammation. And it's an interesting fact that while only 10% of patients biopsied in one study showed an inflammatory uh, process going on in the tendons in the carpal tunnel, 90% of patients get better with an injection into the carpal tunnel for at least some period of time. A year out from the injection, 20% or so are still uh, experiencing a benefit from the injection, but 80% have had some recurrence. But it's a good uh, temporizing measure, and many people believe that it can be a predictor of how well somebody would do if surgery is indicated and performed. And we talk about no time loss, meaning that carpal tunnel, while unpleasant, isn't necessarily a reason to stop working, although job modification might be helpful, but it's a reason to, to seek treatment and institute treatment. If surgery comes to pass, uh, where and how is surgery done? So this is the carpal tunnel again, and this is the median nerve right here. And so whatever means, by whatever means it's done, surgery aims to divide the ligament safely, meaning dividing no nerves or vessels or tendons, and leave the nerve unfettered and free. And so that's uh, the zone where that would take place. And this can involve a fairly extensive incision. Uh, I use a smaller incision than this, but it's nice to be able to see all the structures and protect them. Uh, one of my partners uses an endoscopic carpal tunnel release so system, which involves about a, a half inch incision at the wrist, and then a device with a little um, camera, and a little blade that comes up and divides the ligament from below. All studies show that every type of surgery, as long as uh, complications aren't experienced, has a very high rate of success, and everybody gets back to work uh, at, uh, well, I should say that the difference between the two procedures is that folks with the endoscopic carpal tunnel release tend to return to work a little earlier, but um, the success of each procedure, open versus uh, endoscopic, uh, the success rates are about equivalent and quite high. So it's sort of patient preference, surgeon preference. And this is what you're aiming to do again, is to release the ligament and leave the nerve and its motor branch uh, unaffected, and people do very well in general. Um, some facts you can tell your patients are that pinch strength recovers in about six weeks. The, carpal, the transverse carpal ligament does something. It was put there for a reason by somebody smarter than me. And uh, among the things that it does is it holds the tendons in place. And the tendons, of course, give you finger flexion and uh, can influence pinch. So taking that out actually allows the bony back of the carpal tunnel to collapse out a little bit. And so things get a little bit different than they used to be, and it takes a little bit of time to accommodate the changes. So pinch strength, six weeks. Grip strength may take as long as three months to recover. Uh, nevertheless, folks can do very well. It's a fairly minimal incision. No splinting in general after surgery, just a little dressing. So driving fairly early, writing within a week or two, typing within a month, and heavy lifting. You might want to wait for the grip strength to recover, but uh, six to eight weeks is a good number to think about. So carpal tunnel is bad. But if you think carpal tunnel is bad, you can take a look at some of the problems that we face. And in my practice, which is unusual since I'm based at the trauma center down at Harborview, these are the folks I see more commonly, really, than the carpal tunnel folks. Uh, this is a gentleman who was, uh, who was a calf roper and lost his thumb in the rope. This is a gentleman who works stamping carabiners for climbing and got the hand into the stamper and stamped the hand. And this, I think I'm cheating a bit. It's not actually an occupational injury. It was a driving injury. But for all I know, the driver uh, was on the job. Um, so try to stay with the theme. The World Health Organization, five or six years ago, 
pointed out that severe limb trauma, which can include any of these things, crush injuries, amputations, et cetera, occurs uh, 67.7 uh, times per thousand uh, persons in the U.S., represent 12% of all impairments from any cause, and therefore involve roughly 10 million persons in the U.S. alone. So extremity trauma is a big deal. For those folks, uh, the pictures of whom I just showed you, we have precious little to offer that makes me completely convinced we're doing everything we possibly could. So I'm going to talk about what's available and some of the things that we're working on down the line. So repairs and replantation. This gentleman was on the job. He was working with a log splitter. I don't know what it looks like. I don't want to ever see one. But he, he took off all of his fingers. And uh, so 27 hours later, and some pizzas ordered in the OR, we had the fingers back on. The astute among you will see that the thumb actually died. And this has undergone a second procedure where we just lengthen the metacarpal. But uh, it does function better than no thumb. And these fingers certainly function better than no finger. But in point of fact, they don't bend very well. We can't, after doing microsurgery, let people start wiggling around. They have to be splinted for a while. And so these, uh, all of the small structures in the finger, there isn't really any extra tissue there. Everything matters, and everything needs to glide smoothly with respect to the structures around it. So things stiffen up. So this is actually a stiff hand. And the nerves do regenerate. But after age 10 or so, they don't really come back to uh, normal sensibility. So it's not a great hand. It's better than the day we met. But I myself would like to provide even more than that if we possibly could. If you can't uh, reattach the part, this is just not reattachable. You can't do that. The vessels are destroyed. Uh, if you got inflow, even at the wrist level, it would just bleed out through the central hole in the hand. So this is just a revision amputation. And to his tremendous credit, he went back to work uh, at the same job of record. There are a few workplace modifications and safety features. But uh, you know, I don't know if I would have done that. So he's got my respect. But that's you know, not a surgical triumph. I mean, I, you can't kid yourself about that. So uh, in my opinion, we have an ongoing unmet need because our present treatments ra rarely result in normal function. And so things to think about would be working sort of from easiest to hard. Surgical strategies to improve prostheses. This is going on all the time. I know that last year or your prior partner of mine, Doug Smith, came and talked to you guys about amputation surgery. And, um, prosthetic use, and he's working with collaborators in Chicago on taking the uh, stump side post-amputation and redirecting components of the nerve into, let's say that you have a, a, a transhumeral amputation, redirecting nerve components into the pectoralis muscle so that you can fire a shoulder-mounted prosthesis with, by volition, thinking about moving, say, biceps flexion or supination or something like that, and have individual motors actuating a myoelectric prosthesis. So that is definitely a next step that's uh, um, demonstrating already now in a couple of dozen, I think, patients uh, a markedly improved prosthesis use. And so that's an example of what can be done now to improve uh, function for folks with these severe injuries. Robotics is a coming thing. I think we've got a, we'll talk about transplantation in a minute. Uh, robotics is a coming thing. Obviously, if you think about a combination of the surgery that I just described, along with uh, a much more sophisticated prosthesis, you might imagine something far better than the, the, the claw that we're familiar with from the old days. Tissue engineering, an interest of mine. Regeneration would be the ideal, but it's fairly difficult to imagine regenerating an entire limb from the glenohumeral joint on down, since it takes us 17 years you know, in development and maturation to come uh, up with the limb to begin with. And then as sort of a, a next step in the research arena where I have an interest, what about a biocompatible or a sort of a smart prosthesis? Another option we haven't talked about is hand transplantation. And I think I have just one slide about it. This is already done. It's been done a couple of dozen times worldwide. So far, it requires lifelong immunosuppression. And sometimes the treatment is worth, worse than the disease. You can die from immunosuppression. Folks have done so status post kidney transplant. So it's going to happen eventually if enough hand transplantations are done. Some folks now are working on uh, sophisticated things like mixed chimerism and taking some of the uh, donor marrow uh, early on so that there can be acceptance of the transplanted part by the recipient. And uh, a group at uh, University of Pittsburgh is working on uh, alterations in and diminution of the immunosuppressive regimen so that it's less toxic, maybe just one agent instead of the, the triple agent therapy that's used now. 
so this is, this is a coming thing, but not necessarily ready for prime time quite yet. This is an interesting strategy, not used here yet, but devised by Brandemark in uh, Sweden, I want to say, uh, for amputees and uh, particularly used for lower extremity amputees. But uh, a two-stage process, implanting a socket and then sort of a, a snap-on replacement part that gives you proprioceptive feedback. So when you bang into something, you feel it through the residual limb and is much more solidly anchored than just a, a standard prosthesis, as in the case of this transhumeral amputation, uh, sorry, transfemoral amputation with this gentleman with this little post here. But one of the problems that occurs whenever you have a foreign body implanted in the body is you get a response to it. So he's got chronic inflammation. Some folks end up with chronic drainage and then bone infection or osteomyelitis, requiring that you remove this thing. And then you've lost uh, not just the prosthesis, but more bone than you lost with the initial amputation. So again, an area uh, of some concern. Uh, very interesting idea, but maybe if we could come up with something that truly healed to host bone and truly healed to host skin, we would be a step ahead. So that's an area where I have some interest. We talked about robotics briefly. Uh, we have here now Yoki Matsuoka, who's uh, formerly from Carnegie Mellon at their neurobotics laboratory and now doing excellent work here on uh, neural control of robotic devices and has a very sophisticated way for patterning hand use with robotic devices. DARPA, uh, looking at prostheses as a consequence of the recent events in the Middle East. And uh, the Utah Arm, which is now in its third generation, I think, goes back 25 or 30 years. Very sophisticated now with flexion, extension of the wrist, forearm, supination, and pronation. And uh, at least pinch with the thumb and index and middle finger. Uh, so progress being made. So who's this guy? This is the newt. The newt is, uh, to quote many authors, the, the champion of regeneration. The newt can regrow a limb, the newt can regrow an eye, can regrow part of a heart, uh, can regrow part of a jaw. Just the most amazing, amazing thing. It does so by sort of making a population of stem cells uh, at the injury site. So from left to right, uh, the amputation site, the cells actually go back in developmental time and de-differentiate, and they become stem cell-like. And it turns out that while the dermis, a component of the skin, comprises just a very small part of, say, a cross-section through the arm. Dermal fibroblasts comprise 42% of the regenerate. So it looks like the fibroblast, which is a cell that kind of gets no respect, is just this dumb cell that's left over when the good cells are sort of washed away. It turns out the fibroblast can do remarkable things. And so we're interested in my lab and my collaborators' uh, labs in what the fibroblast may actually be doing to orchestrate the redevelopment of the regeneration of a limb. And uh, so this is a model of, of the, the newt regenerating a limb. And the question arises then, do we have such a capacity in the human organism, in any tissue? And it turns out that actually kids will regrow a pretty good fingertip after amputation if you leave it alone. So this is a patient of mine who was seven at the time that she stuck her finger in her brother's bicycle spoke and lopped this off. And they came in quite distraught, as I now, as the parent of a four-year-old, I can understand. And I'd be, you know, come on, get this thing back on. So we ran off to the operating room in 77 minutes of tourniquet time. I still remember it. And uh, looking for the, there's two little digital vessels. And, and at the very end of the finger, they coalesce to one little terminal pulp artery. I'd never heard of any of this stuff. And I couldn't find anything. I couldn't sew it on. Who stuck it on is what we euphemistically call a biological dressing, which means we're going to let it just rot there like a scab. And uh, darned if it didn't do a very good job of regrowing a pretty good, not perfect, but a pretty good tip. So if you look back at the original amputation site, this thing's right off at where the nail begins. And now you've got the whole nail, and so a fair chunk of digit has regrown.